apologize in no i don't apologize in behalf uh, in on behalf of my uh, speaking in my vernacular but i'll be sure to provide you with a translation as and when appropriate uh, okay uh, having said that let's start uh, let's start okay so uh, today we will be talking about academic writing the title of this uh, discussion is academic writing the why and the how i have with me a rather badly written flowchart and uh, i'll be referring to it from time to time and in case if you have questions uh, uh, there are two options you can either keep it to yourself till the end of the talk and ask me at the end because uh, there will be a time for asking questions or you can type it out in the chat box and i'll find an appropriate time uh, to answer them as and when possible okay so uh let's let's start with understanding what academic writing is and why is it important and what exactly does the term academic writing mean and why is it why and how is it different from writing in general now uh, contrary to popular belief some of you might be uh, thinking that academic writing is is the writing which uh, scholars do uh, that is uh, ones who teach at colleges universities or one so do research uh, that is not exactly true as of always let me start with a very uh, real life example which i have encountered uh, most of you uh, if not all are already familiar with the name of amitabh ghosh uh, who is the latest recipient of the ganpit purushka uh, if you read his books books fiction and by books i mean fiction and not non fiction books like gun island books like hungry tide or shadow lines in my very limited and personal opinion i believe that those books qualify as academic writing because uh, though he is not uh, i don't think he is a professor anywhere i'm not very sure um, but those books definitely don't fall under the quote unquote uh, heading of academic writing in general therefore why am i calling that academic writing and uh, would then would that mean that a book like say uh, black skin white mask or the wretched of the earth uh, will books like these be not qualified as academic writing of course they will be but uh, that's just the definition the academic part comes from not exactly the formality or the tone but from the content of it from the thing on which you are writing that is what qualifies it to be academic writing now i don't want to go into a uh, theoretical details too much because i know no one is interested in that including myself so that's uh, so uh, let me just quickly uh, start with how do we begin academic writing and how do we actually start to understand how uh, should we uh, read it right Can anyone tell me how uh, the unpinning thing works on uh, Zoom? How how do you unpin? I mistakenly pinned myself. Yeah, this is fine. Okay, so uh, just a. Uh, quick start up on how to begin academic writing so here we will understand a few things about whom to read and whom to avoid that is in terms of pure scholarly writing now before i go on from this point let me uh, quickly state that i am uh, and i have always been a student of english literature so uh, 99% of my uh, talk will be based on the humanities 
and uh, specifically or the references will mostly be from english literature or from uh, literature in general and if i am sure there are people here from other subjects but the point is not that the point is that you have to understand that academic writing has to be done that at least the academic writing that we are talking about that academic writing is in english therefore even if you are not a student of literature i would strongly suggest that you read some authors and then you uh, i would also suggest you to avoid some but then why am i asking you to avoid some authors precisely because uh, we are all young people right uh, and the authors whom i'm trying to tell you to avoid these are the people who have spent 10 years to uh, who are these are the people who have spent 10 years to write a single essay therefore uh, it would be a little too much on our behalf to expect to understand them right at the first go that's why i have made a small list and of course this is uh, my personal opinion and i i don't take any responsibility if someone holds me accountable for this list and i personally like some of the authors whom i am asking you to avoid uh, i know that sounds hypocritical uh, i'll come to that in a bit so if we are talking about the authors you should read and these are i'm talking about uh, authors who write theory of course it also includes amitabh ghosh because he's my favorite uh, you should read people like sigmund freud amitabh ghosh cloud revis strauss karl marx antonio gramsci and there are a lot more these are the five top five contenders in my opinion i'll repeat uh, sigmund freud amitabh ghosh cloud revis strauss and uh, antonio gramsci and uh, about people whom you should avoid it includes homi bhaba uh, jacques lacan uh, althusser hegel kant uh, even to some extent some of their ideas i would say uh, now uh, when i'm saying avoid i mean <laughs> avoid as in read them after you have read these like all of these people they have a predecessor so if you are to understand them you have to understand the first person now enough about uh, uh who to read and whom to avoid uh, let me start about what most people are interested in that is the technicalities of writing how to write how to differentiate between an article and essay a book chapter a book a book review an introduction uh a remark a conclusion a prologue an epilogue all of these are parts of academic writing and what should you write what should you write is my question so there are three main categories one is uh, a paper that is an academic paper the other terms for it include an article and an essay the other thing is uh, a chapter a book chapter and the third thing is of course a full length book now in my opinion if you have reached the stage where you are writing a full stage full full length book then this this discussion is not for you if you have already superseded the little amount of um, do ability i have with academic writing if you are at the first two stages which i am also at then i can uh, give you some pointers first is how to choose a topic right uh, someone from this uh, these uh, people i think it was shruti yesterday or the day before who was talking to me about uh, how one should choose a particular area of interest and then a uh, focus on that itself now after uh, i made my point uh, she agreed with me actually but here i would like to point out that while you are writing academically your focus should be very clear to you that is you should know what you are trying to say and what the, i'll spend the majority of this session talking about how to make a flow chart something which uh, if you look at this i i have made myself and i always make this this diary is full of flow charts and uh, uh, it it really helps me and i believe it could help a lot of other people as well so i'll also talk about how to write flow charts so for example i am interested in psychoanalysis and i want to do my phd on it so i have reached a level while i where, where i know what what to do my phd on but what about young undergraduates who are in the first year second year third year or even students in their ma not everyone has it figured out right from the beginning 
what about them if they don't know what their preferred area is well a very easy way to go about it is to read a little bit about everything that is there are only a few not a few maybe some areas of interest if uh, uh, in case someone is using a mobile or a laptop uh, could someone uh, copy paste the cs uh, stats open thing no uh this is a website which uh, i'm sure already 90% of you already knew about this is a website run by the university of pennsylvania and it has a lot of things it has a list of topics for on which you can click and find what seminars are coming up what journals are accepting uh, articles for that topic you can find a section called uh, conferences you can find a section called journals and collections of essays for those of you who didn't know this website has saved my uh, life and my career and it has saved the life and career of many academics this website is uh, all almost all of my publications except one were uh, collected by me from this website so uh, this website gives you information about where what is going on so it's basically someone else keeping an update for you therefore you don't have to do the hard work i mean of course some people do the hard work that i myself have submitted a couple of cfps there on behalf of a couple of colleges uh, but the point is that because people submit therefore the world comes to know and therefore it becomes easy for you to locate what you want to write on right so therefore you have to now decide what you want to write do you want to write a, an article or an essay or a book chapter now there is not much difference between the two in my personal opinion only the thing is that a book chapter is more like an open ended research whereas a, an article tries to reach some sort of conclusion if we are to a point at the technical differences between the two and also a book chapter is generally longer in nature of course that is not a very valid difference uh, essays could be long as well therefore uh, you have to understand that academic writing comes in two forms mainly two forms for young scholars that is a book chapter or an article also in this context let me mention uh, there is something called a predatory publishing which uh, let's see who who all are here who can tell me this predatory predatory publishing is basically when the publisher takes money from you to print your work and if you think about it it will sound ridiculous to you but people do it all the time i did it once myself because i was stupid not to say i'm not now but a little less maybe uh point is any journal or book publisher if they are asking you for any kind of money except the money which it takes to send your journal from their place of publication to your home which is the postal charge which won't be more than 100 bucks in any universe unless it's being sent even if it's sent from the us or the uk they will send it to you for free because they are good journals uh, if it's within india they they are uh, cheap they are often running short on money so they take postal charges from you anything except postal charges is considered predatory publication and let me warn you anything that you publish in a predatory journal or any book chapter that you publish in a predatorily published book won't be calculated while your api is being evaluated for those of you who don't know or who don't who didn't listen to my voice note in the group or from for those of you here who are not from my group uh, api is the academic point index which is evaluated when um, you are applying for a job that is a, a job of uh, teaching at a college say for an example for example as an assistant professor uh, now i am aware of the fact that just because you are interested in academic writing it does not necessarily imply that uh, you might be interested to pursue research at the highest level or are interested to teach in a college for those of you who are and who want to do publication precisely for its Uh, logistical advantages which includes me by the way i do publication mainly because it gives me a logistical advantage and not because i'm interested to do it uh, therefore 
for those of you who want to do it for the logistical advantage let me tell you this for once and for all that if you do it from a predatory place it will not be counted because the ones who are sitting on the opposite side will know so if they are asking you for any money don't do it there as simple as that therefore where should we publish is a question which i had last at i had uh, kept for the last because but since it has come up let me point out where should you publish or where should you send your writing before we go on to how to write because um, some of you here have already written something and are wondering where to send it or are wondering where should we uh, submit this to the golden rule is if it is published by a college or a university or by a reputed publisher in that case it's always a good bet now i know this sounds as uh, uh, ridiculously simple to a lot of people but trust me it's not often times it so happens and here i'll i'll share an anecdote which happened to my friend uh, his name is rishab uh, he went to a seminar in midnapur college ononna if uh, ononna is not here uh, if someone uh, went with him there Uh, midnapur college held a seminar on post humanism in september 2019 where uh, uh, he published a paper uh, and then the organizers promised that they will publish that paper in a book and in the uh, uh, run of it they omitted his paper for no good reason even after claiming that his article was accepted and they made him sign a contract and all stuff like that he also made a very big facebook post about it uh, you can check it out uh the thing is just because it's published by a university or college does not necessarily mean it's good in general of course all rules have an exception uh but in general for example uh, but all of these are not ugc kl listed now for those of you who don't know what the ugc kl list is it's a list maintained by the university grants commission of journals which are cared for by the ugc they don't care they couldn't care any less basically it's a list of journals where if you publish your right your writing it will be considered as an achievement and it will be considered as a publication for you in all the universities and colleges across india now in the year 2019 ugc published a fresh ugc kl list that is the updated list which had at least 43 predatory journals and it omitted out great journals like essays and studies like a journal of comparative literature and analysis uh, and uh, aesthetics like um jadavpur journal of comparative literature uh, like uh, rupkatha uh, i don't i'm not 100% sure about rupkatha but the other three i'm sure these journals were omitted in the ugc kl list and they included uh, predatory journals like uh, they to the predatory journals like uh, there was a spin off of news india i'm forgetting the name they included a lot of predatory journals that's what i'm trying to get at here so uh, since that update ugc kl list has not been seen with the same reverence as it once was though some universities and colleges including our very own dear calcutta university still refers to it for god knows what reason however if you are publishing in a journal or a book published by a college or a university 99.99% of chances are there that your publication will be considered as a valid or a legitimate one right uh, and if and if even if it is online for that time being right therefore if you if you want to submit the best shot for you would be to submit to a college university or a good publisher now how would you recognize a good publisher you might be wondering a good publisher uh, things like routledge oxford macmillan orient black swan cambridge the list is very long these are just some if you are uh, an avid reader or if you are a smart reader then you will know who the good publishers are uh, you can make a list and then check out their cfps on their respective websites spoiler warning it often happens that these uh, uh, publishers when they release their cfps they don't keep any qualifying criteria for the persons who are sending it 
However, if you tell them that you are an undergraduate student or a postgraduate student or someone who does not have a PhD or is not at least a registered PhD scholar, even if your article is brilliant, they will reject it or they will say, we wait for seven years before you complete your PhD, then come back and then we will publish it. It has happened to me and to a friend of mine. One article of mine uh, is suspended with, uh, <laughs> one article of mine is suspended with Taylor and Francis for the past four years, I think. Uh, so they have told me once, uh, come back to us once you are a registered PhD scholar, and I plan to. I have not sent that article anywhere else because the publication from Taylor and Francis would mean a lot of good to me. So these are little tidbits. For example, uh, let me give you another example. Uh, Jadavpur Journal of Comparative Literature, a, a, a journal published by the Department of Comparative Literature at Jadavpur University, has its as its qualification the same requirement but you will not find it mentioned anywhere. It's basically like an unwritten rule. Therefore, before you are sending something to somewhere, it's always advisable to send them a brief detail about you, asking whether you qualify or not. That way, it will save you the trouble and the subsequent potential disappointment. When they say that your article was brilliant, but since you are a kid, we can't accept you. It's a... Uh, what word should I use? It's a bad rule, but we can't do anything about it. Right. So submissions are basically, uh, and also you can submit to conferences organized by similarly good colleges and universities. Right. Uh, and often these are uh, published in uh, conference proceedings. Now, here is a very critical thing you must know. If your paper is published in a conference proceeding, if the book if the printed material which you are holding on your hand, in your hand, or which of which you have a digital copy, if it says conference proceedings on the top, no matter how good it is, most Indian universities won't consider it a publication. Because it's basically just an, a collection of everything that was uh, said at the same time. And it did not go through any selection process after the full paper was written because it's conference proceedings and not selections from the conference or a book published by some of the presenters of the conference, which is different. It's not conference proceedings. Therefore, if some college or university offers to publish your work as a conference proceeding, I would suggest that you avoid it because uh, that could potentially lead you to give away your paper to a place which would which, which won't be even counted as a publication. And the fun part is, even though it's not counted as a publication, you can't publish it elsewhere because that would be self plagiarism according to uh, these uh, people. That is the people who decide what self plagiarism is and what isn't. Therefore, it's uh, highly advisable that you uh, avoid conference proceedings as a publication uh, opportunity, no matter how um, delicious it might sound to you. Now, of course, there are exceptions. Suppose if you have managed to present an average paper at a brilliant institute, and you are not so sure whether you can publish it elsewhere, right? And they are not asking you to put any further effort into it, and you are just hoping that this would be something which you can put in your CV, which is the only literal advantage of a conference person is that you can put it on your CV. Suppose if it's a conference by the University of Oxford, you can of course put it in your CV and your CV would go up by a 15%, right? So in that case you can, but in all other cases, uh, I would advise you to keep it to yourself and publish it elsewhere. The key to academic writing in any, uh, for both academic writing and academic publishing, I realize that this is becoming more about publishing than writing. Uh, of course, the two are related. The key to both of these is patience. You have to hold on. That is, you have to outlast uh, everyone else, right? Uh, first, uh, you have to outwork and then you have to outlast. Uh, these are terms I recently learned from a Facebook video I was watching only today morning. Uh, there, there's this guy called Khalid Farhan. I recently discovered him and he was talking about uh, four strategies how to win. And um, I think it applies to academic writing as well. You have to first outwork and then you have to outlast. Therefore, we now come to the structure of a paper. 
right a structure of a paper and i though i am using the word paper i am also referring to a book chapter right so i'm just using the word paper for your convenience so the structure of a paper is that at first comes the abstract and the abstract is the key the abstract is the cornerstone on which uh, the entire paper is built and several places only ask for an abstract especially conferences conferences 99% of cases they ask for abstracts journals and books might ask for full chapters up front sometimes they also asks for, they also ask for abstracts as well i'll also here mention a very weird thing which uh, shonglap did shonglap is a journal run by three of my seniors ashorit da or koda and shamrat da you can check it out it's a brilliant journal it's uh, indexed by ugc care scopus uh, copernicus it's it's one of the best journals in india at this moment you can definitely i would definitely suggest you to check it out it's shonglap s a n g l a p uh, they also have an up, uh, ongoing cfp if i'm not very mistaken you can check it out uh, so shonglap uh, last year uh, no not not last year 2019 Uh, shonglap uploaded a cfp about academic writing uh, that's why i'm mentioning it in, in this seminar uh, about academic writing and uh, about uh, english academic writing i think english academic writing english pedagogy syllabus things like these and uh, they asked for two abstracts of the same paper one was a short 250 word abstract and the other was a long 1000 word abstract which is till date the longest abstract i have written um, now you will realize that this is the essence of an abstract is that you have to tell what you want to do in very limited words therefore there are some rules of writing an abstract which we were taught actually in an academic reading and writing course uh, at the university of delhi during my uh, ongoing effort that is there are few rules of writing an abstract the first is that you cannot go into any detail which most people make the mistake of doing you cannot go into any detail abstract is a generic it's kind of like thinking out loud and it's generic uh, what are the things which should be included in an abstract of course it should include the primary texts for those of you who don't know primary texts the word prime the phrase primary text means the main uh, books tv shows images whatever it is that you will be primarily looking at in your paper those are primary texts it should include the names of the primary text your working hypothesis that is what is it that you are expecting what is the question which you want to answer for example your question is uh, is uh, is ercul poero a good detective say for example this is your question and for this question you want to look at the murder of roger ackerman death on the nile and a murder on the orient express say this is your question and these are your three primary texts these two informations should be there in your abstract right next you have to tell them how you plan to test your hypothesis that is you will plan to test your hypothesis by uh, asking whether poero has solved these mysteries in these books in the least amount of time possible that is whether there are clues inside the book i think this is a good paper idea nice uh, whether in these books there were clues which could have been uh, caught before they were and therefore proving whether poero has solved these cases at the optimum time or at the uh, optimum minimum time or not therefore you will do a close textual reading of these three texts and you will try to find out an answer to this question right that is there third and the final thing is that what do you expect to gain gain out of this uh, out of uh, answering this hypothesis what could this potentially lead to that is a few open ended questions or a few open ended uh, interpretations could serve you well therefore and what are the things you should avoid you should definitely avoid examples 
if you are writing a 250 word abstract or even a 500 word abstract for that matter examples don't bode well specific textual specific textual instances don't bode well uh, specific mentions of theorists sometimes it bodes well sometimes it doesn't if you are say for example if you want to work on lacanian psychoanalysis in that case you have to mention lacan but if you want to work on analysis in psychoanalysis in general with freud and uh, lacan together then you can just mention that you will be taking a look at these texts from the perspective of psychoanalysis no need to mention freud and lacan specifically and fourth and most important no name dropping this applies to both your abstract and your paper name dropping is absolutely not acceptable that is uh, you cannot just go ahead uh, and start your answer paper on psychoanalysis uh, by uh, saying uh, by writing there is no big other at the top and that's just a quote and there is no explanation to how that relates to the paper that won't bode well for you that is an example of name dropping though even if your paper directly deals with psychoanalysis but has no relation to that quote even then that is name dropping so name dropping is absolutely not allowed not 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 allowed per se but not recommended therefore an abstract should be clear precise direct and it should potentially give something which has not been already given that is it should try to find out something which has not already been found out right so here comes the aspect of doing research for a paper and here is something which i will talk about is called the literature review uh, literature review is basically a a broad idea of the work which has been done on and around this topic for uh, in the last 50 years preferably more but last 50 years let's say right so if you do a literature review how to do a literature review simple google searches help say for example if you google academic articles on agatha christie you will get a, a lot of articles right and if you take a look at just if you take a look at their titles you don't even have to read all of them if you just take a look at their titles you will understand how uh, they these articles contribute to your argument or are they making a different argument if there is an article whose uh, a title you find interesting maybe you can read the abstract or the full article so basically you have to do some research to uh, make sure that what you are saying has not already been said right therefore that is an abstract but what is key in an abstract is the keyword or the keywords uh, all journals or all submissions don't ask for a keyword but in my opinion you should always include keywords whether or not they are asked for if they are asked for definitely even if they are not you should include five uh, five is the optimum number of keywords for any paper or journal or any paper or essay or book chapter five is the uh, optimum number in my opinion why five why not more see uh, how do keywords work keywords work through something which we call which we uh, uh, def which is defined which is called search engine optimization that is uh, what happens mm, i'll show you how it works So this is Google Chrome, okay. So suppose if I uh, type Professor Shonku academic article. Now I'm typing this because I know what result will come up. Right. You can see that the first article which comes up is uh, uh, an article written by me, which has as its keyword the term professor shonku when you put a keyword in your abstract when you put a keyword in your abstract and in your paper google automatically turns that keyword into one of its search engines therefore the better your keywords or the more appropriate your keywords or the more popular your keywords are the higher chances you have of your article coming up up front when someone searches anything right especially on the this website called google scholar 
which is an uh, which is a sub part of google where almost only academic articles are available then therefore how do we choose the keywords and what keywords to choose and what keywords to omit for example uh, if i am writing a paper uh, let's take the example of the paper i just showed you uh, it's a paper on uh, post humanism in the stories of professor shongku therefore of course uh, from the title it's very clear what two of my keywords were one is of course post humanism and the other is of course professor shongku now you have to understand that just because it says keyword does not mean that it has to be one single word it could be a phrase of three four words as well uh that is something which people often mistake uh that they think it should be just a word it could be two three words or even four words one keyword could even extend up to four words therefore uh two of my keywords were of course professor shonku and post humanism uh the other was artificial intelligence the other was shottajit ray and the other was futurism these were my five keywords now since i know that shottajit ray is a stalwart a figure who is often googled therefore i chose this though my uh, paper does not have so much of a reference of the of ray as a person or ray as a writer outside these the stories i chose but i still put it as a keyword so that my article uh, gets more online traffic that's that's how you should choose your keywords if you are working on a uh, work if you are working on a project which even has say uh, 20% of shakespeare then you should definitely put as put shakespeare as one of your keywords because uh, that will increase the visibility of your article online right so the choice of keywords should depend on obviously the content you cannot omit uh, you cannot omit keywords like professor shonku and post humanism from this paper but you can uh, afford to include a keyword like shottajit ray right therefore you should choose your keywords very carefully next we will come to how to begin drafting a paper or an essay or an article or a book chapter here you have to know what you want to write that is what uh, as you call uh, uh, as is as is called in bengali dabi taki huh? if if it's translated to english it goes as uh, what do you want to say it's not a good translation it's just rough translation what do you want to say why are you writing this paper what is it that you have to say that should be the center block of your argument and around that then you have to build an introduction then you have to link that introduction to your main argument then you have to give your main argument the bulk of the paper then you have to give connect that in main argument to a conclusion which could lead to potential future research all academic papers are small research works therefore the structure of it or the research for it should be exactly like a research proposal where it should have a literature review it should have a methodology it should have a hypothesis it should have questions limitations modulations complications and a conclusion right so how do you do this then therefore this is where uh, we will uh, talk about flow charts now how do you make a flow chart for for making a flow chart you have to understand that background is very essential which is why i spent a good deal of today's lecture quite unnecessarily you might think but you will realize its necessity later on quite unnecessarily i spent quite a lot of today's time on speaking about the generic academic writing if you think about it all of this is a part of my plan to help you understand how you should structure your paper because this this talk that i am delivering though with little to no preparation is just structured exactly like a paper with an introduction an introduction which contextualizes and situates 
the importance and relevance of this discussion in today's day and age and then we directly go into specific details which constitutes the bulk of today's talk right so you have to go point by point that is how will i connect a, a background of say a uh, crime fiction in the in the west to agatha christie right how will i point out that her identity uh, is is something to be um, to be revered how will i point out that she is different from the others that is something which you should that is the uh, using the example which we uh, talked about a few minutes ago how will we connect these two things right so therefore you should go by connecting the previous point to the next then the next to the next next to the next and you will see that uh, a flow chart not, does not necessarily go from up to down it could go sideways and then come back go up and then come back it's a very complicated uh, much like the graph of desire okay that was an uncalled for reference uh, please forget i said anything about the graph of desire uh, it resembles uh, somewhat like a spider's web something like a spider's web right uh, therefore you should uh, make a, a flow chart and should you should be careful that uh, the rule for an abstract is just the opposite of the rule of a paper in the paper you are supposed to give examples you are supposed to take specific textual exam uh, instances and then analyze them and you should be very clear as to what you are wanting to say right uh, what i will do is uh, i have read some very good academic papers in the past i've read some very good academic papers in the past but the problem with referring to someone else's paper is that you don't know what they were thinking therefore what i'll do is i'll uh, send across uh, probably i'll send across one of my papers uh, to the group or uh, not all of you here are from the group are you uh, i'll make sure uh, you can search it online uh, just type my name and uh, it will be there uh, so if you take a look at any of uh, my papers not the best example but any of any good papers you will see how they are very clear and concise in their way right and uh, you should also uh, keep in mind that while we are talking about uh, analysis uh srijani roy is saying could you drop the papers here or maybe just put in put in the names of the papers hmm just give me a second yes I think I can drop them. Yes, of course. Uh, let's go with this one. This is one. I like this one. Okay, I, I believe the two files have been sent. Uh, you can uh, download them from the chat box. I believe I, I have never sent a file in Zoom chat box. <laughs> I don't know how it works. I somehow managed. Uh, if you read, say for example, if you read uh, the Tagore Unconscious paper, which I'm not supposed to share, but I did, and who cares? Uh, you will see that though I have dealt in something. Uh, I dare say complicated as psychoanalysis. 
I have avoided using almost any jargon. I don't. I'm personally not a very big fan of jargon. Why? Because uh, if you see, uh, Rishi Roy is saying that she can't see any paper. Uh, what about the rest of you? Did you get the two files that I uploaded? No. Okay, that that is all. Can't see. No, can't no see. file. That's not enough. That's sad. Okay, I'll do something next week. For every problem, there is a solution. Don't worry. Okay, please uh, don't mind uh, the name of the folder. Uh, okay, I have managed to. I have this all of this on my Google Drive. I know it says published crap, but some or most of it is, but it's just for my benefit. Please excuse the nomenclature of the folder. Uh, I believe the file document is accessible to everyone now. What I was talking about is that jargon doesn't help you a lot unless you have become someone like Spivak or Bhava, who I don't believe everyone likes. Uh, the point is that you have to make your paper readable and understandable to everyone. And if you are using jargon, and most importantly, if you're using jargon unnecessarily, there are people who use a lot of jargon, but use it necessarily, like Lakaw, for example, which is why I advised you uh, to avoid him unless you have done some background. In that case, it's acceptable. But if, if they are using jargon unnecessarily, then it becomes problematic for the average reader to read and understand them. Therefore, I always suggest you to read, write it, in, write in simple and straightforward English. When do you use jargon? You use jargon when you are explaining your methodology, or you take a jargon and then you put your own spin to it. For example, when I am writing my third chapter of my thesis. I am mentioning that I am talking about language as the center of a, a riddle, language as the center, that is the structuralist center of a riddle. And I am talking about how when I am translating, that center is decentered, and as a result, translation is a process of deconstruction. It's a little complicated. But when you are giving your own spin to it, when you are understanding center as something which not not as something which Derrida had identified, but as something which you have identified, in that case you can explain what center means in two paragraphs. There, therefore, from that point onwards, center does not remain a jargon or deconstruction. What do you mean by deconstruction? Deconstruction, if you explain it in a paragraph and a half. It does not remain jargon anymore, and the reader then knows what is your understanding of deconstruction by reading your understanding of it. And then, whenever that word is mentioned in the subsequent parts of the paper, they don't have any issues understanding what exactly do you mean by that. Therefore, uh, you it's useful to uh, elaborate on jargon and not assume that your reader knows everything. That is my my fundamental policy with academic writing is that always assume that your reader is ignorant. Is that your reader knows nothing, yeah, that your reader is John Snow. Therefore, to explain something to someone who doesn't understand, you have to tell them a story like, like as if you are explaining something to a child. 
that is why you have to use very smooth and lucid language and not complicated language here is something which i have learned in my uh, in my experience is that uh, the ideal sentence length is not more than 60 words 60 the ideal sentence length is not more than 60 words and it should not have more than two subordinate clauses not more than two subordinate clauses and not more than 60 words. The moment you cross these, though I'm sure you will be writing a correct sentence, in some cases, even that is not possible. You might end up writing an incorrect sentence. Even if you write a correct sentence, the reader will not be able to follow. Right? We were made to write a 5,000 word paper with sentences of 30 words or less. Three zero, not 60. 60 was the ideal length. We, in our MPhil, we were made to write a 5,000 word paper with all sentences less than or at most equal to 30 words so that we have a control over the length of our sentence, which is very crucial in understanding uh, academic writing. Similarly, the ideal paragraph in 1.5 spacing is not more than half a printed page. The ideal paragraph is not more than half a page in 1.5 spacing. If it's going uh, past that, I would advise you to break the paragraph and take it to a new one, even if you are uh, continuing with the same point. Uh, let me just show you something quickly here. Uh, this is a book which I have not managed to read in the past three years, precisely because in the first 80 pages, there is not a single paragraph division. This is Autumn of the Patriarch by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. In the first 80 pages of this book, there is no single paragraph division. There might be one or two, but no, nothing major. Right? It's something uh, uh, quite similar to uh, Penelope from Ulysses. Or only the difference being that instead of not ending a sentence, uh, Mark has decided to not end a paragraph. Effect is quite the same. Both of these books are regarded as highly unreadable, if not one of the most unreadable books in not English literature. Uh, this is a translated English, translated into English, but in literature in general. Easily, uh, in my opinion, one of uh, Actually, I have managed to finish Ulysses, but I have not managed to finish Autumn of the Patriarch. I find this one more difficult, precisely because of the lack of paragraph division. Language is not that tough. Therefore, small paragraphs do you well. And the key is to know that one paragraph only has to say one thing and its elaboration. If you are going on to say a new thing, shift to a new paragraph. Right. Therefore, and also you have to keep in mind that all paragraphs must have a topic sentence which should come at the beginning, at the first sentence, or at most the second sentence. What Now, what is a topic sentence? A topic sentence for those of you uh, who have watched Brooklyn Nine-Nine, you uh, might, might remember Terry saying this to Jake, that uh, bad news, and then Jake then saying, but that is bad news. And then Terry said, that, uh, yeah, that's why I said bad news. Terry believes in having a clear topic sentence. Uh, that is basically a topic sentence. The topic sentence is that which declares what your purpose is, right? Uh, for example, a topic sentence could be something like, uh, some of uh, Shottojit Rai's works had not been translated into English until the year 2020. This could be a topic, potential topic sentence. It's a topic sentence which I have used in my uh, in the introduction to my thesis, uh, and therefore it means that I'm going to talk about the frequency at which Ray has been translated into English. It sets out the goal which you are about to achieve in that paragraph, and if you are using clear and sure shot topic sentences, that means. Uh, Srija is asking about the minimum length of a sentence. Uh, in academic writing, I would say it shouldn't be more than, uh, shouldn't be less than six to uh, eight words. Oh, paragraph. Uh, 
good question. The ideal length of a paragraph, uh, I would say, uh, smallest length of a possible paragraph, I would say, is uh, not less than eight lines, not eight sentences, eight, eight typed lines in 1.5 spacing, eight, nine lines, I would say. Because less than, lesser than that, it looks like a block quote. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know what block quote is, I'll come to that when I talk about citations. Uh, less than eight, uh, seven, eight lines looks like a block quote to me. So uh, I would say at least eight lines uh, in 1.5 spacing. Number of lines remain same irrespective of the spacing, but I'm just saying. Uh, so uh, yeah, so a clear topic sentence also helps you to uh, also helps you to um, sail smoothly from paragraph to paragraph quickly and. It also, uh, if you have a flowchart, then the topics of your flowchart could serve as very potential topic sentences. And if you are writing a big chapter or a big, big article, say 5,000 words, 8,000 words, 10,000 words, if you're writing something big as that, uh, now what is big and what is small, right? If it's something less than 3,500, again, all of this is my opinion, less than 3,500, it's small, 3,500 to 500, 5,000 standard, 5,000 to 8,000 big, 8,000 plus very big. So if you're writing something standard or big or very big, in that case, you might to we might want to divide your work into small segments, which are called subdivisions. Now, this is, this is a mistake which I made in my first chapter of, and I'm obviously all of this is from my personal experience. Of course, my, some of you might not relate to this. Which topic Dia Das is asking, is this topic important for the authors, radio jockey, journalism? Uh, Dia, I don't understand your question. Could you kindly elaborate? You can also unmute and speak, I don't mind. Basically, how it is important, this, uh, this topic, I mean, uh, academic writing, how it is important for us? Uh, uh, who is us? I means I mean for I'm means English honor students or uh, who are studying in journalism mass communication or communicative English major. Uh, I think there was some sort of miscommunication. This is purely academic writing, which is based on uh, getting your work written and published for academic purposes. It doesn't really have anything to do with journalism, uh, though. Uh, if you are a good academic writer, I believe you would be also a good journalist because journalism includes writing. But uh, for English honor students, of course, if you know how to write, ac write academically and write well, it could uh, also help you to write your answers. Because not only is this the structure for this relevant for a paper, it's also relevant for your answer an answer which you might be creating on your own for your university examinations or for preparing for any particular topic or for thinking in a new direction which has not hitherto been thought of. So in that case, but the things that I am talking about, these are strictly restricted to uh, writing a paper and then publishing it, not, not really about journalism. I hope uh, that answers your question. Uh, so uh, subdivision, this is something a uh, mistake I made in my thesis. That is, I didn't divide my chapter into parts. And as a result of it, uh, uh, what is uh, called in Bangla as uh, uh, that is uh, to uh, translate it to English. Uh, I made a mess of it. I, I did not structure the chapter well. Let's put it that way. I did not structure the chapter well. Therefore. If you structure the chapter well, that is, if you make subdivisions, for example, if the first subdivision of your chapter is uh, an, an overview of the three Christie texts, that is talking about the Christie example we talked about before, an overview of the three Christie texts. An overview of the three Christie texts uh, followed by uh, a detailed analysis of, say, a murder of Roger Ackroyd. Detailed analysis of death on the Nile and detailed analysis of uh, murder on the Orient Express. And then a connection of the three. If you give these headlines, then your brain will automatically tell you to focus on these while you're writing in these topics. 
or under these topics. So uh, subdivision is important, right? And then we come to the most critical part, something which I terribly suck at, and I have been uh, reprimanded every single time I've submitted a submission and was accepted or even rejected. Every single time I have been reprimanded for this is the conclusion. I don't know how to conclude well, so I'm just warning you. What I'm about to tell you in the next five six minutes is uh, probably not the best advice out here. There might be better. Of course, that applies to this entire talk, but who cares? Conclusion: There are three types. First is well, you uh, summarize everything that you have said. You have made a summary. Second is you propose new ways to look at this. That is something which you have not done in your entire paper. You just give some possible insights. And number three is you make a list of the limitations of your paper. Now, I would strongly suggest that you don't do the second. That is, you don't give out potential ideas because you could then expand your paper or the right second paper. If you just give, give out an idea, uh, others might steal it. Uh, especially if you give out a good idea. That is, for example, if you're talking about post-humanism in the works of Professor Shonko, and then you talk about how this could be applied to say Westworld, right? And then someone will be like, Are, this is a nice idea. I'll work on this. And then they get their paper published on the same idea, which you could have worked on in the future. So I would suggest uh, third technique uh, was uh, making a list of your limitations making a list of your limitations or the limitations in your paper. That is, these are the places where I have fallen short. I am aware of that. And despite that, I have, uh, despite these shortcomings, uh, this paper has been written. That is quite similar to the conclusion of a thesis. That is, these are the limit, uh, uh, the conclusion of a thesis generally concludes with limitations, uh, quite similar to uh, the ending of a thesis. So that is uh, more or less it about the structure of a paper, which uh, can, uh, took up, oh my God, it took up a lot of time. Uh, okay, uh, I have a lot of other things to say, a lot. Uh, but I would ask uh, the people present here uh, that if there is anything that you want me to cover, tell me. Uh, I'll, I'll do that now and then I'll move on to the things that I want to talk about. Especially, uh, um, I think it was Shruti who told me that I should take some time to talk about citations, something which I hate with a vengeance, uh, but I'll still talk about it because we can't do away with it. If there is something that you want me to talk about or something that I have missed or some clarifications that you want, you can tell me now and I'll be trying my best to talk about that in the next 15 minutes maybe. Why will they select my article to publish, Snigda? Firstly, uh, there's a small error. Midashridi. I know, I wish so as well. Maybe I could list a few predatory journals. I don't need to. If you Google, you will easily get a list. Uh, UGC Care, the website of UGC Care has a sub. Uh, Hi, Aritra, Shalini here. Yes, Shalini. Uh, Aritra, so like as a rule, any publication that asks us for like, like you know, a publication fee, Mm -hmm. I just saw a uh, CFP was there. They were asking for fifteen hundred rupees for for a publication fee. Right. So like, so that could be marked as a predatory journal, or are there yes. like? Uh, that is a predatory journal for sure. Okay. So there are no journal, good journals who ask for publication None. fee, right? Okay. Not, not only that, very good journals like EPW, Economic and Political Weekly, very good journals actually pay you to write for them. Is that is should that should be the case because but most of the time but what happens is it's basically a free transaction, right? Yeah. Also the it's also the rule with peer reviews. Mm. Uh, I have done a couple and they have not paid me anything. Uh, I don't complain because they gave me a certificate which I included in my CV. But 
the point is beyond that the point is that since they are asking me to do something for them uh, especially if it's a uh, say if it's a requisition piece talk about requisition. what generally happens is that they say that we will give you an issbn and we will publish you in this and uh, your number page, book chapter will have this and this something which i can write in my cv but you just have to pay this fee so i generally avoid all this because i don't want to pay someone anything right yes of course that is true they are this is the reason why uh, places like the university of delhi if there is someone from the university of delhi here uh, oh that's me okay uh, the university of delhi in its ad hoc uh, recruitment does not accept book chapters as a legitimate publication surangona mitra uh, yes uh, i don't know what you study uh, but uh, uh, but delhi university ad hoc recruitment does not consider book chapters to be legitimate publications because 90% of them are predatory in nature right so uh, good journals very good journals like epw or routledge oxford even uh, for uh, for that matter uh, i'm currently writing uh, for a spanish journal and um, they have um, promised me a fee for writing for them that was because it was a requisition piece but uh, that is beyond the point i'll come to requisition pieces a little later uh, as a concluding point or any point time you feel comfortable covering just like give two three lines on how this like published number of articles number of articles i have published will help me like you know secure a post in for phd for students who are still right. in graduate right, like right, me right 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 yes of course i i will i will come to that thank you i'll just write it down uh, phd journal i think okay so phd journal uh, right Uh, so what i was talking about uh, let's uh, quickly solve uh, the problems uh, first is uh, sujoni uh, ugc care list has a list of predatory journals you can take a look uh, next is uh, snigdha uh, snigdha is asking why will they select my paper uh, what qualities should be there someone has their mic on i'll mute them Uh, Singha is asking why will they select your paper? Well, they select your paper mainly on three grounds. One is the uniqueness of the idea; it is the most important. That is the uniqueness of the idea. The idea is the center of the paper. That is what you are trying to say. If it's new and if it's promising, they will select. Second is the way you have written. That is the academic writing. Whether you have made any grammatical mistakes, whether you have made any structural mistakes, whether you have been able to uh, channelize your thoughts. in a sequential chronological matter uh, not according to the amit shah meme of chronology samjhe not that but uh, rather according to real chronology of events if you have been able to uh, arrange your thoughts chronologically or sequentially second and third if you are submitting a full paper if you have cited your work properly though the third criteria should not really exist but it sadly does of course uh, it also depends on your research on whether you have uh, it could also be rejected on grounds like if you have not done enough research or the fact that your research was not up to the mark right you have missed out on uh, considerable uh, amounts of contribution by other people things like that right uh uh medashridi before i come to citations let me quickly answer shalini's question uh shubham says shubham that is uh i don't think i can i have never published a video essay in my life i i actually am this is the first time i'm hearing about the publication of a video essays uh, that is if you're not talking about films uh i have absolutely no idea uh, but i can uh, i can tell you uh, that there are people in the film studies department who will help you with this and uh, jadavpur university film studies has some brilliant people you can contact them via email and i'm sure they will help you okay uh, before i go to citations uh, how do peer reviews work oh my god this is a very good question this is a brilliant question peer reviews uh, work basically so when you send your journal article they ask you to send your article without any uh, Yes, I'll, I'll come to references. Uh, 
they ask you to send your article without any identification without your name or without any anything that could uh, that could be used to identify the fact that it is written by you therefore it's called a blind paper a blind paper is one which does not have the na name or identity of the author so when you send a blind paper every journal or every publisher has a list of experts who are their list of reviewers right so for example i am on just one list uh, that is on the list of llids language literature and interdisciplinary studies so uh, and uh, my areas are poetry translation and i think literature something like that uh, so uh, when a paper comes on which uh, say for example if you submit a paper to llids on uh, and i'm using this as an example and i would request you not to take this out of this conversation uh, if you send in a paper to llids about poetry there's a good chance that it would come to me right and i would be asked to review this paper on seven grounds or 12 grounds or 20 grounds so they'll send you an excel sheet or a word document where they'll give you 20 categories on which you have to rate the paper or on which you have to give remarks on the paper for example if they have done proper research if they have cited their paper well or if they have structured their paper well if the english is lucid if it's understandable huge categories like these and based on my opinion of that paper and finally they'll ask do you think it should be published or not right so they generally send a paper to multiple people say three people uh, generally and based on that based on the majority of votes that is the majority of votes uh, as to yes or no they then tell the person that your paper has been selected or rejected and in most cases they tell that your paper is accepted but you have to do some edits these are the edits which are the, which are in turn supplied by the peer reviewer right all peer review is blind in nature that is you don't know whose paper you are reviewing and you don't know who your reviewer is right that is how it works and they all journals have a list of peer reviewers and your goal in life that is if you are wanting to stick to academia your goal in life is to be on as many of these lists as possible right uh, the more lists you are on the easier it is for you to publish a paper because if you are a peer reviewer on a topic just think about this for a moment if you are a peer reviewer on a topic that means it has been already accepted by the journal that you are an expert on that topic therefore if you are submitting a paper on that topic to anywhere else everyone basically this list is not a very secret list everyone is more or less aware of who is where uh, you will also be aware if you are in this field long enough uh, um, if you are in this list and if you are sending a topic paper on the topic on which you are already a peer reviewer there is a high chance that your paper will be selected because you are already considered an expert right so and uh, then you will you will then wonder how do i get myself registered or is there a process there is no process uh, people will come to you once they read your work and if they after reading your work if they think that you are an expert or you can be considered for peer review they will come to you on your own on their own and then you can say yes of course no one ever says no i, I don't think anyone ever says no uh, right so that is how peer reviews work okay now coming to citations oh god citations citations were basically uh, designed to help you promote your paper that is uh, so that when i am writing your paper and i am mentioning you your name and the name of your paper will be there at the end of my paper so that when someone is reading my paper they will also know the name of your paper and then they will also read your paper this was the concept of citation today's day and world this concept has completely vanished citation is basically a process to ensure that you are not copying from anyone else without giving them credit that is citation is a and i know this sounds wrong but citations citation is legal plagiarism citation is basically legal plagiarism and that is why there is a limit to the number of uh, to the num amount of citations you can have in your paper i think it's 15% for most cases or maybe even 10 or 20 depending on institution to institution that is you can have 15 to 20% 10 to 20% quotes in your paper right 
so citations there are three main types of citations one is the mla that is the modern language association it is a very big and celebrated institution from the united states of america the other is the chicago style which is uh, run by the university of chicago quite unsurprisingly and the other is the apa style and it's so boring that i don't even know the full form of it uh, that's why i'll keep apa out because i hate it and i have never used it in my life i love mla mla is as they call it or call it in millennial lingo mla is bay so uh, i love mla uh, basically the pol policy is that every citation is uh, has happens on two levels one is the in text citation that is a citation within the text of your body of your uh, within the text of your paper and a reference or a citation now here onona's question becomes important as to what is the difference between a reference and a citation there is actually none uh, thank you shalini for giving me this absolutely um, unimportant piece of information uh, she says apa is american psychological association and i decided to believe her uh, i i know i'm just kidding uh, so uh, the point is uh, in text citation that is a citation within the body of your paper and a reference or a citation now if you are giving an in text citation then against that in text citation you have to give a citation at the end of your paper in terms of a words cited i know this is a little difficult to explain so i'll, I'll try my best to to do this i believe uh, you can see a white board can you see a white board yes sir okay thank you uh, so suppose if uh, this is your text right so this is your text and then you are writing a quote right say for example you are writing where the mind is without fear and the head is held high right this is your quote and then within brackets you have to write the surname of the author that is in this case tagore comma or no comma depending on the variation the page number that is this is i'm talking about mla according to mla 6 there was a comma and after 6 that is in 7 and 8 comma has been omitted uh, tagore say for example 33 right Okay, this is a quote from Tego. Then, in the works cited, that is uh, here, oh, this is a bad idea. I'll do something else. Let me show you. Aritra, sorry, uh, interrupt korchi, but uh, oh. if you, ha, bolchi je jodi tui citations bojhate charge ta hole, I guess uh, you could share your screen and ha. on MS Word you could. Ha, you know, otay kochi, o, otay kochi, otay kochi, otay kochi na. O jani bollam je this is a bad idea. Thirty uh, three. Uh, What is thirty three? Thirty three is the page number. On the... page number on which this quotation occurs i i'll i'll explain uh can i ms word hoy dekha to dekhabo na because i hate ms word but i'll do something simple okay uh, i think we are ready yeah so this is my first chapter of my mphil thesis please i request you hat jor kore kyo please ko kona uh, i'll show you how a citation works ah yeah here it is 
So read this on your screen. Shukanta Chowdhury writes in his book Translation and Understanding, and then there is a quote. The reason why this quote is uh, separated from the text is something we will come later. Uh, but there is a quote, right? You can see the quote on your screen. And after that, you can see that there is a page number in the bracket, or there is a number in the bracket which you don't know as page number, but that is the page number. So the in-text citation is basically a reference to the name of the author and the page number on which, again, this is MLA, uh, page number on which that that quote occurs. Now you will then question why, where is the name of the author in the brackets? Now, this is a rule which says that if you are mentioning the name of the author before the quote itself, then you don't need to mention it in the uh, bracket itself. See, you have to understand something here, which is that uh, the purpose of an in-text citation is to let someone know that you're using someone else's quote. So if you're already mentioning the name of that person in the text of your uh, chapter or your article itself, then what purpose does it remain for you to write the name of the person again in the brackets, right? So therefore, this bracket only includes the page number because the name of the author, Shukanta Chudri, is already mentioned uh, in the text of the body itself. And therefore, against this in-text citation, you have to write, uh, you have to give a citation at the end in the words cited section. As you can see here, it says Chodhuri Kamashukanta full stop, translation and understanding full stop, Oxford U Oxford UP comma 1999. Right. Now this is a rule for citation which you will easily find on EasyBib. Cite this for me, the MLA handbook or your seniors any one of these resources work uh, for knowing how to go about this structure of what comes after what. Is the manual uh, for, uh, citation recommended or a software? Uh, Srija, I would personally recommend manual, uh, though I know some great scholars, including Shammo, who is typing helps, uh, who I don't, I think he uses a software and some other great scholars as well who use software. Uh, I personally like to do it manually because the more you do it manually, the less problem you have subsequently. If you ask a software to do it for you, uh, there is no scope for mistake there. I agree. But if you are doing it manually, at least you are learning. While you are looking up the website or uh, the handbook, while you are reading one type of citation, your eye automatically goes to five other types. So you are learning in that way. Right. Therefore, I would recommend manual citation. I have done all my citations manually except one, which I didn't manage to do. Uh, therefore, I had to go to cite this for me. I generally avoid cite this for me, though it's a brilliant software, uh, but I, I personally avoid it. Right. So this is the uh, way in which a works cited column looks uh, in front of you. Uh, as you can see that it is uh, arranged alphabetically. There is no numbering and there is an indentation which is uh, for those of you who don't know, this is called the hanging indent. Uh, you can easily find this in the format column, in the align and indent. If you select these, you will see that these are all hanging indented. As you can see on your screen, all of this is hanging indented. That is uh, to separate the second line from the first by a small tab from the left. That is, it distinguishes the start. Why is this used? It distinguishes the start of a new citation and the continuation of the previous citation. That is the reason this is used. No other reason. Some publications uh, directly tell you no need to use this. 
Now, some rules which people might not be aware of. Uh, this is how uh, in text and works cited works. The references, uh, this is a reference. Will I find one here? That is the laptop question. Wait, I'll show you something. Uh, see, here is a reference. This is not exactly a reference, but this is a footnote. Uh, footnotes are a part of reference. So what does this footnote say? This footnote says all translation of titles, dialogues, and other excerpts from both the written text and the televised version of the same have been done by the authors of this paper. Now, this is a reference because uh, I have used some translations in this paper, right? References uh, could be footnotes, end notes, uh, I'll show you a reference. Uh, just give me a minute. This is a reference. Oh, why am I showing you this? Oh, yes, yeah. See, this is the reference column. As you can see, there is no difference between this and works society. This is uh, another one of my published works. Uh, as you can see, this is, uh, it has, uh, it says references, but it's just divided into primary resource books and things like that. And there are also notes. There are eight notes on this paper, which I had included as footnotes, but uh, due to their uh, pestering, I had to shift it to end notes. All of these are references. It also has an appendix. Uh, these are all, uh, if, uh, some, if uh, someone here knows uh, their Jean Genet, uh, the, uh, Gerard Genet, if, some, if someone here knows their Gerard Genet, they, they would know that these are parts of paratext. Uh, that is uh, text beyond the text. Uh, as you can see that there is no difference between this and works cited, uh, except that there is no indentation. Right. So references are generally a variation of works cited and it's generally divided into things like primary resources, secondary resources, books, online resources, DVDs. It completely depends on the place where you are submitting that what kind of citation they want, right? Yeah. Yes, Debadrita has uh, pointed out something very useful. It is that sometimes citation generators can refer to a different edition or make incomplete citation. Hence, unless it's a JSTOR citation, citations generators are, uh, I have not, uh, I'll come to Srija's question a little later. Uh, yes, sometimes citation generators make mistakes. They generally do. And they also might refer to different versions of your paper, might give you an incomplete citation, might alter the order. They might refer to MLA 8 while you are referring to MLA 7. These things happen. Therefore, manual is best. Srija is asking a question, is saying that you have clubbed your resources according to groups. Is it necessary? First of all, I have not. The editors have. I just gave a list and they grouped it and did whatever they wanted to. Basically, when you're submitting to a good journal, no, you don't have much say. Whatever they decide you have to do, either, either you have to do that or you have to take out your paper. Now, of course, you won't do the latter, right? You want your paper to be published. So they often uh, dominate upon you. They often give you instructions that you don't want to follow. For example, I didn't, I genuinely didn't want my notes to be end notes. It makes a lot of difference for the ones who genuinely want to read. Uh, end notes and footnotes make a lot of difference. Uh, I genuinely didn't want end notes to be there, but uh, they insisted and I had to say yes. 
these things make a lot of difference because every for example if there is a note if there is a superscript on page one and the note is on page 10 you have to go back to page 10 and then read it otherwise if it's if it was there right on your footnote you would have just taken your eye down on the page and you would have the have it in front of you therefore if if it's your choice i would always recommend that you use a footnote so uh, all these details the details like how to cite uh, what to write uh, which which ones should be italicized where to put a comma where to put a full stop uh, whether to use pp in front of page number uh, whether to use both a whether to use a digital version or a analog this is also a very important question if uh, your article has two versions uh, say a digital version and an analog version uh, which version should you use my opinion is that you should always use the digital version it's safe uh, and you will if you if you're downloading it from JSTOR, you will have it already cited for you. You just need to make a few changes here and there, right? So if you are if if there is an online version, I would suggest to cite the on use the online version and cite the uh, physical version. This is something which I I read I read it online and then I cite the physical version. Irrespective, see, please understand something. Just because an article is there on JSTOR or just because an article is there on ResearchGate does not necessarily mean that you have to cite it through JSTOR or ResearchGate. You can just cite the original paper. Who is going to check whether you have read it from the original journal or from JSTOR? Who? No one, right? If you are going to cite it from JSTOR, you have to put in a lot of other things like the word JSTOR, the word web, the URL, the date of access, a lot of other shit, right? Pardon my language. Uh, so, uh, Therefore, I suggest that if there is a physical version, cite the physical version while reading the online version. It's, it's a hack which I have discovered for myself and all I have shared it with some others. Right. Uh, so citations, uh, so uh, that is more or less it. Uh, also, there are some uh, very critical things like uh, uh, a block citation or uh, an indented citation. This is a rule which applies to both MLA and Chicago. That is, if your citation, if your quote is more than four lines in length or 60 words, whichever is lesser, I'll repeat four lines or 60 words, whichever is lesser. If it's more than that, then your uh, citation should come in a block separated from the left hand margin by half an inch. Right? That is called a block quote. So that you, the reader immediately knows that you have taken a chunk from someone else. That is a block from someone else, right? Also, uh, just uh, in-text citations are not related, not limited to uh, direct quotes. If you are borrowing an idea, if you are paraphrasing, if you are summarizing, if you are even arguing against someone's ideas, that is, if you are directly taking someone's idea and then arguing against it, you should also use in-text citations. Also, in this context, let me mention that works cited and bibliography are not the same thing. Bibliography is a list of all the books, articles, and whatever other things are there that you have read or are planning to read for that particular paper. Not necessary that you have, you must have mentioned all of them in your work. And if you are writing a bibliography for a paper or for your thesis chapter or for a book chapter, it should be it should be exclusive of the items listed in your works site. That is the items which are there in your works cited should not be repeated in the bibliography. So we put it, to put it in simple terms, the items which are there in your works cited should not be repeated in your bibliography, unless of course your editor tells you to. In some cases, they require you to do this for some citation purposes or for in, ex, expanding their bibliography or things like that. In some in cases like that, it's important. Otherwise, it's absolutely uh, not necessary. Therefore, uh, to conclude, I, I realize I have spoken for more than one and a half hours, and now people will probably throw uh, tomatoes at me. Uh, therefore, see you need questions. Uh, Zotero, Shammo is uh, mentioning Zotero. Uh, I had Zotero on my uh, previous laptop, gave me quite a hard time. I didn't understand how the interface works, uh, but for some people, I have seen it work for some people, so you can definitely check it out. 
Shrijoni, uh, where is Shrijoni's question? I have lost it. Which question are you talking about, Snigdha? I, I, uh, could you kindly uh, repeat the question? Uh, in the meantime, if, if there are other questions, uh, you can uh, put them in the chat box or unmute yourself and tell me what your questions are. I, I know that uh, most of what I have said is theoretical and not much practical experience. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Point is that academic writing as an endeavor, academic writing as an endeavor, must be done PhD API uh, publication. Yes, okay, thank you. Shall no question. Right. Uh, right, I'm coming to that. Uh, what I was talking about is that how uh, Rishti is a, has asked a very good question. Is simultaneous submission advisable? Yes, yes, a hundred times yes. Let me tell you something from my personal experience that submissions and acceptance and rejection could, and in all probability will take a very high toll on your mental health. You will write brilliant papers and you will find low grade journals rejecting them. It will happen. Take my word for it. My honest request to everyone here is that don't give up. I'll tell you, I'll uh, share an anecdote from my life in this context. I had an abstract which was rejected four times. Once by the University of Pune, once by uh, CLI, a Comparative Literature Association of India, once by uh, the University of Calcutta, and I forgot what the, what the fourth one was. It was rejected, the abstract was rejected four times. I then made a research proposal out of that abstract and uh, uh, gave that research proposal to the University of Delhi as my MPhil research proposal on which I am now doing my MPhil, which is almost complete. The uh, crux of this is never give up. Also another thing, I have been submitting one article to uh, seven journals I have submitted to this day and six of them have rejected it, seventh one. I have submitted now. Point is, uh, this is something which I always tell to everyone, you have to be on your team. Because if you are not on your team, you cannot expect anyone else to be on your team. You have to first believe in yourself and in your work. Of course, if someone gives you a feedback, of course, you will have to work on that and improve your article uh, based on that. But then continue submitting until and unless it's successful. The acceptance ratio in India, especially for undergraduate and postgraduate students, is one is to 10 or maybe even more. It may be even more, right? So for every 10 submissions you make, one of them will be accepted. So at no point in your life should you lose heart, right? Academic writing is all about patience and perseverance. It's not about writing. You will learn writing the moment you start practicing. Uh, that's also another tip I would like to say that practice, practice, and practice. Nothing is better than practice. Just set small goals like I'll write 500 words a day. I have had this goal for the past two years, uh, almost two years. That is from the beginning of 2020. No, from the uh, from September 2019, I, I had started this goal that I'll write 500 words per day. No, doesn't matter what I write, but I will write 500 words per day. Start small, but be consistent. Like, don't make it like something like going to the gym. I have made a membership, but then I decide not to go. Generalization, I know. Just an example with some people, what some people do. If you have set a goal for yourself, follow that goal. Of course, on some days, you will not be able to do it. So on some days, you will write 2,000 words. That's perfectly fine. But if you have set a goal for writing 500 words a day, you will eventually see that at the end of the year, you have six complete papers. It happened to me, and I, I bet it will happen to you as well, if you are consistent. You have to be consistent and you have to keep writing. And also in this context, I'll come to both the questions. Uh, sorry, I know I'm, I'm sounding a little bit like a motivational speaker right now. Mm, I always believe, even in my class, I do these things. And it's generally well accepted that I'm going with the flow. Uh, point is that 
if you keep writing you will automatically improve and you also must make a small group of friends seniors juniors colleagues whoever small group 3 4 people who will share their article with each other with complete trust because if you don't have a peer review group of your own who will review it uh without the blind part in it also in this context let me uh, note that the term blind peer review is ableist it should be changed uh the fact that uh, if you are if you have a group uh, who will read your paper honestly samo mathe gatta mar uh who will read your paper uh, genuinely and then give you feedback you will improve and you will have to do the same for them so just set small goals for yourself and then build on them in the future that's it okay questions uh simultaneous submissions advisable yes from that i uh, digressed a lot yes definitely unless it's not allowed by the publisher to whom the submission right uh, that is i submitted to cli uh, last year in june uh, no not june yeah june i submitted to cli in june 2020 and they have still not uh, sent me an acceptance or formal acceptance or rejection though i know that it's accepted from inside information uh and i am not being able to submit it anywhere else because they have a policy that we want the thing which you sent to us cannot be sent anywhere else there is also something else that is uh, some people uh, allow simultaneous submission with the condition that it, if, if it is accepted elsewhere and you would like to pursue it through that through that route you would have to let them know immediately so please read cfps carefully and yes submit it to as many places as you can because then it will increase your chances of being accepted it also often happens that a paper which is rejected by a comparatively uh, lower grade journal is accepted by a higher grade journal right also the other thing can happen or uh, it could be rejected by a higher grade journal and then accepted by a lower grade journal doesn't mean that if it's rejected by a journal which is not so good it, it shouldn't be sent to better journals it you you should always take your shot the worst thing that could happen is that they will say no that is the worst that could happen nothing worse could happen to you yes uh, shalini has asked about phd and api uh, for those of you who don't know api is academic point index i think i mentioned this in the beginning of the video uh, may not this in another video talk uh, so uh, for every publication you have one point in west bengal or two points outside even in west bengal in csc you have two points per publication so if you are publish if you are applying for a phd then your publications will help you but informally because for a phd admission there is no api calculation right your academic point index is not calculated formally that is on pen and paper there is no list so uh and this is said unofficial that calculation is done it's not showed or is it's not formally published but that calculation is done therefore strongly recommend that in your master degree days don't make the mistake which i did i did not publish anything when i was in my master degree because i was uh, the, that is the reason why i'm doing this uh, irrespective of what year you are in whether you are your, in your ug1 or in you are in your phd final year or if you are an assistant professor i don't uh, it doesn't make a difference start publishing because even if you don't plan on staying in academia it will help you it will make help you make contacts it will help you better your writing it will help you build your patience it will help you face the world in a better way start publishing and start publishing right now start the process today and if you start it today it will take uh, it will come to fruition in a year from now i had started my publication procedure from the month of june 2019 and my first article got published in april 2020 i think or february i don't remember eight uh, it took almost eight ten months to get one article published and that was also not from a very good journal uh the point is that uh it doesn't help formally but if you have publications the more publications you have the better impression you create create for a phd admission that is to answer shalini's question but i will also take it in a larger scale 
uh, for uh, job applications, irrespective of the fact whether you're applying for an academic job like an assistant professor or a guest lecturer or a contractual teacher, irrespective of that, even if you, if you have publications, you will always be treated better than those who don't have it, right? If you are going for a uh, job like CSP or PSC, of course, it is there in the written rules that uh, for every publication you get two points. Uh, unless of course they decide to do a quality based publication analysis this year, which they might according to inside information that is uh, difficult and complicated let me not go into that uh, yes phd uh, publications uh, publications do help in phd admission strongly suggest something though that uh, don't publish anything on which you're directed in the phd something again a mistake which i have made because no one told me uh, i directly published something on which i wish to do my phd and now i'm suffering from it for it so for, for example if you want to do your phd on say suppose if you want to do your phd on the way in which uh the way in which uh bengali language is taught to people outside Bengal, right? Say your uh, PhD on ISM discovery, how Bengali is taught to people outside Bengal. Say uh, there's a center for teaching Bengali in Germany, one is there in France, one is there in USA, one is there in England, lots of places. Bengali is taught almost all over the world. Suppose if this is your PhD topic, don't publish something which is directly related to it because then you will suffer. I don't know why this rule exists, but they believe for some reason that they you will copy from yourself. Even if you promise them that you won't, they won't believe. Right. Uh, I am suffering for this presently, and I would advise you to keep that writing for you yourself. Don't publish it. Let your PhD be over, then you can publish it wherever you want to. No one is running away, right? You will have a ton of other options. Just publish something else. And of course, if you're going for any job, of course, your publication will be calculated. That is, if it's a peer review and good journal. Now, what is a good journal is a very difficult question to answer because I believe uh, that it differs from university to university, institution to institution. But generally, as I said, college university journals are always accepted. Did I miss any questions? Anything else? Uh, which anyone wants to know. He shared full form. Sintha is asking full form, which full form of what? Any other questions uh, you can ask? Block quotation. Block quotation doesn't have a full form. Block quotation is just block quotation. Anything else? Questions, queries, comments. I end up speaking in two hours. If there is nothing else, uh, I think uh, it's time for us to call it a day. I don't see any responses. Yes, Anunna, I will be uploading this on YouTube, I believe. And uh, thank you, Katusha, for your constant support. Uh, okay, then. Thank you to everyone who came i am really grateful that you could manage time and uh...